morning. In the last two lectures, we have traveled to the east and the south of the Mediterranean during the first decades of the 7th century. We have dealt with a long war between the two main empires of the late antiquity and with the birth of Islam in the Arabian Peninsula. In this lecture and in the coming ones, we will return towards the Mediterranean carried by a wave of which we have already investigated the causes. In 632, Muhammad had died without having appointed a successor to lead the Ummah. He had stated that he had been the seal of the prophets, the last of a long series. However, the designation of a guide for the believers was needful. It fell upon Muhammad's companions, who had shared with him the immigration to Medina, the foundation of a state, and the conquest of Mecca. In the days that followed the prophet's death, they faced a decision that could have provoked the disintegration of Islam or propagate its sweeping wave. Muhammad had no sons. His closest male relative was his younger cousin, Ali, who was also the husband of one of the Prophet's daughters, Fatima, and had been the first male to convert to Islam. The new religion, however, was born in opposition to the tribal mentality, and the logic of the succession could not have been dynastic. A strong candidate was Umar bin al-Khattab, the most charismatic of the Prophet companions. However, he probably realized that his own personality, intransigent and austere, was not ideal for this delicate passage, which required a large consensus on the choice. It was Umar, anyway, who determined the outcome of the process. During one of the meetings that were being continually called in those days, he took everyone by surprise by acknowledging Abu Bakr as Muhammad's successor. This is the meaning of the word Khalifa, and swearing allegiance to him. As we have seen, Muhammad had run the state of the believers. He had been also his, its sole legislator and judicial authority. His successor, the Caliph, had to cover those roles as well, although he was not a prophet. An immense authority, a power almost without boundaries. The companions of Muhammad, however, agreed to the choice of Abu Bakr because he could satisfy both the Meccan and the Medinese community, opposed for so many years after the Hijra, and which could easily have resumed hostilities. Abu Bakr had been one of the first converts to Islam and was the father of Aisha, one of the Prophet's wives. He had followed Muhammad in the Hijra and had been one of the founders of the Medinese community. At the same time, he belonged to the powerful tribe of the Quraysh, whose recently obtained support had to be retained at all price. Finally, Abu Bakr had always been Muhammad's trusted advisor. He knew personally many of the tribal chiefs of the peninsula and was a generally liked man, balanced in his judgments, wise and modest. He became the first of the four rightly guided caliphs who ran the caliphate in the 30 years after the Prophet's death a period that many Muslims still regard as a phase of complete adherence to the value of Islam. The task awaiting the first caliph was very difficult. Muhammad, Muhammad's great achievement has, had been to establish a truce among the tribes of Arabia, which had been fighting and looting each other since time immemorial. Most tribal chiefs had adhered to the new religion, but the warrior spirit of the Bedouin could not be extinguished by a few agreements reaching force of Muhammad's prestige. More solid appeared the tribe's interests established over decades 
sometimes linked to the geographical features of territories of appalling poverty. In the deserts of Arabia, the control of, small, of a small oasis, of a well, even of a single tree, were very valuable goods. All wars were at risk of being reignited, now that the mediator of Arab conflicts was no more. Some tribal leaders claim that they have sworn allegiance to Muhammad, but not to his successor. Other questions the payment of taxes to Medina. Others still demanded the division of Arabia in zones of influence. Some of them even based their claims on other prophets. We know that at least three of them existed at the time. One of them was actually a prophetess. The Middle East had always been a land of prophets. Its arid landscapes were strewn with broken faiths. This multi multiplicity of erosive forces, revealing itself after Muhammad's death, is known as the Ridda, the Arabic word for apostasy, defection. Confronted with the danger, Abu Bakr decided to reaffirm resolutely the political authority of Medina. No one could have claimed to belong to Islam unless he paid taxes to Medina. The armed forces of the Ummah, under the command of Khalid bin al-Walid and the other chiefs of the Quraysh, uh, were dispatched to submit the rebellious tribes of northeastern Arabia, of Oman, of Yemen, of southern Arabia. With the so-called Ridda Wars, the new super-tribe created by Muhammad gained control of the Arabian Peninsula within 633. These campaigns trained the future commanders of the Caliphate's army. They were a prelude to conquests of unprecedented scale. This expansion was inherent to the process that Muhammad had set in motion. The tribes of Arabia had always lived in a state of intermittent war. Their ethos allowed for raids against the other tribes, although it set limits to the destructiveness of such practices by forbidding violence against women and children and the damage of property that could not be transported. Those ways of life could not possibly have changed overnight. Now, the new religion forbade war among the believers. It also forbade infanticide, a widespread practice in pre-Islamic Arabia. Burying infant daughters alive was a mean of demographic control in one of the most hostile environments of the planet. However, the geography of Arabia did not allow the Bedouins to settle down and live a proper agricultural life. As the tribes of Arabia adhere to Islam one after the other, their ways of life could continue only if their raids were directed to the outside. This was the trigger of the first Arab conquests. A great force had been unleashed, but it had to be firmly governed because it implied great dangers. The first two caliphs were no less crucial to is for Islam than St. Paul had been for Christianism. They realized the risk that the legacy of the Prophet assumed a purely local character instead of projecting a universal message. When they pursued new conquests at the expense of the neighboring empires, the flag of Islam continued to reunite all the Arabs who were at last gaining access to the fertile lands from which they had always been excluded. Already during the Prophet's life, there had been signs of that tribe. For instance, in 629, during the chaotic phase that followed the defeat of the Persians by Heraclius, a group of Medinese raiders had ventured into Palestine. A few kilometers east of the Dead Sea, in the village of Muta, they had been intercepted by Roman troops. The tombs of these unlucky forerunners of the Islamic conquest can still be visited today in Jordan. Furthermore, in 631, Muhammad had organized a military expedition to the city of Tabuk in the extreme north of Hijaz. The uh, Islamic army found it empty. The Byzantine had withdrawn into their fortresses and the inhabitants had left. The expedition was a failure. 
but it shows that Ummah was able to assemble significant forces already during the Prophet's life. The real penetration into Syria started already in 632. It had been preceded by the submission of the Arab tribes living in the semi-arid border zones. While the Rida Wars were extending the control of Medina to the entire Arabian Peninsula, the tribes embracing Islam were requesting to the first caliph the permission to carry out raids in foreign territories. Abu Bakr had sent four small independent armies to the north of Arabia. These expeditions, like the Rida War, tra trained the future commanders of the caliphate, such as the future governor of Syria, Muawiyah bin Abi Sufyan, or like Amr bin al-As, who conquered Egypt a few years later. But they also started a real war. In 634, a Byzantine patrician of the maritime city of Caesarea set out with cavalry troops to check the Arabs who had been raiding the region of Gaza. A battle ensued in the village of Dathin. The Arabs prevailed and killed the Byzantine commander together with some three hundred of his troops. This started a war that would last for centuries. At about the same time, other Arab armies were raiding the border uh, with the Sassanian Empire. The defeat Suffered by the Persians against Heraclius had been followed by a period of instability. A son of Khosrow II, Havad, had ordered the execution of his own father and half-brothers, and taken the power, only to die himself shortly thereafter. With the royal family almost completely wiped out, different figures had ascended to the throne in rapid succession. Some of them not belonging to the Sassanid dynasty. This instability had weakened the control of the um, Persian state uh, over border areas. Already in 633, during the Rida Wars in the east of Arabia, Khalid bin al-Walid was active along uh, the Persian border. He had then captured a few Persian forts and occupied al hira the capital, uh, the former capital of the buffer state of the Lachmids. Then the city of Ambar, further north along the course of the Euphrates. But before a, 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 he could launch a, a, a deep incursion into Mesopotamia, Khalid received from Abu Bakr the order to reach Syria, where the war with the Romans loomed. In 634, the brightest commander of Islam, known as the Sword of God, crossed the desert of western Iraq to appear unexpectedly near Damascus. Syria had been for centuries one of the most prosperous regions of the Roman Empire. From its ports, goods produced in Arabia, in India and even in China alimented the Mediterranean commerce. Syrian ships transported to Europe the oriental spices and the silks profusely used in the courts of the Goth, Frank and Lombard kings. They also carried commodities from the Near East and Northern Africa, among which wheat, linen, papyrus and olive oil, indispensable at the time for, both for lightning and for nutrition. In the ancient world, the Syrians were the typical sea traders, as the Dutchmen would be in the 17th century. Syrian communities flourished in every important port, Mediterranean port, uh, from Constantinople, Alexandria and Carthage, to Rome and Marseille, up to Spain and even to Britannia. The fall of the Western Empire and the barbarian invasions had not substantially altered, altered this picture, especially after Justinian had wiped out in 534 the Vandal Kingdom in Africa, re-establishing thereby the complete control of the Eastern Roman Empire on the 
Mediterranean Sea. Syria had been also important from the point of view of cultural influence. It had been the cradle of Christianity. It was in Antioch that the followers of a new religion had, called, had been called Christians for the first time. The region had given to Christianity eminent figures of mystics and theologians. For about a millennium, the language of the elite in Syria had been Greek, but the country had significant linguistic, ethnic and religion diversity. A large part of the population spoke Aramaic, a Semitic language close to Arabic, still surviving in a few villages. Um, additionally, there was also an Arabic-speaking population, mostly belonging to the Christian tribes, tribe of the Hassanids. They used to control a vassal state of the Roman Empire. However, towards the mid uh, of the 6th century, this prosperous region had been struck by the global calamities that preceded the Middle Ages. The first of them had been the Justinian plague, a pandemic that, starting from 540, literally depopulated the eastern Mediterranean region. A bacillus carried by parasites of rats and transferred to humans by flea bites caused bubonic plague. The contagion spread from port cities to the inland and stopped only in front. Of the desert. Its impact on Syria was devastating, as also shown by the region, recent archaeological evidence of a stop in rural construction following the pandemic. The plague relapsed several times during the following century. It reversed the demography of the region and the extension of agriculture. It wasted countless towns and villages. It aggravated fiscal exactions on survivors and dealt a terrible blow to the economy of the region. A second calamity affecting Syria had been religious intolerance. It had crept into Syria's social fabric already at the time of Justinian, but it became stronger with the 7th century. The rural population of Syria was largely monophysite or miaphysite. If I may somewhat simplify a very subtle debate, miaphysitism was a milder form of monophysitism, affirming that in the person of, person of Jesus Christ, divinity and humanity were distinct, but present in one mia in Greek nature. Fusis. Justinian, and before him his uncle Justin, strictly adhered to the condemnation of monophysitism by the Council of Chalcedonia. From then on, the situation of the monophysites and miaphysites in Syria wavered between discrimination and persecution. At the same time, at the time of focus, a fanatical orthodox, a true bloodbath has taken place in Syria. Um, and even after the death of the tyrant, the atmosphere of religious fervor prevailing during the war had contributed to the bitterness of non-Orthodox Christians. And in fact, the third calamity that fell upon Syria had been the war itself. During the war waged by Khosrow II, the Persian army had rushed into Syria already in 611 and withdrew only in 629, nearly 20 years later. During this long occupation, most of the Greek-speaking elite fled to Constantinople or Carthage. Um, the continuity, represented by several centuries of Byzantine administration, had been completely disrupted. When the Byzantines regained the control of Syria, a large part of the population had no longer experience of the imperial administration. Non-Orthodox Christians were confronted with a power more, in, more intolerant in religious matter than the Persians had been. In addition, um, the Roman Empire was nearly bankrupt after the war. In those times, current expenses were not financed as a modern state by a public debt repayable over decades. The sums needed had to be collected immediately, normally in gold. The collection process was hasty and brutal, normally unsympathetic with people in dire straits whose means had been reduced by the war or by Persian exactions. After the end of the conflict, Heraclius had to pay the troops, the administrative apparatus and the church which has financed his campaigns. This coincidence of demographic decline, 
fiscal exaction and religious oppression created favorable conditions for the army conquest. The Bedouins regarded Syria and Palestine as territories blessed with abundance, in which wheat and olive trees could grow together with legumes, grape and delicious fruits. Some Arabs had been involved in commercial relationships with those regions. Some of them had escorted caravans thither, as the Prophet himself, when he was still a merchant. Since time immemorial, those territories exercised an irresistible attraction on the peoples of Arabia. As a Bedouin poet later wrote, not for the love of God you were fighting there, but for that of bread and dates. The rapidity of the Arab conquest amazes us. The Western Roman Empire had fallen after centuries of pressure exercised by Germanic tribes on a consolidated and well guarded limits. Those tribes had been mostly requesting hospitality in the Roman Empire's territory. They nurtured the myth of the empire. They absorbed at least partly its language, its religion. They had been gradually filled with, they had gradually filled the empire's military ranks to the point that some of their chiefs had covered the double role of barbarian kings and of Roman commanders like Alaric. Odoacer and Theodoric. By contrast, there was no fortified limes at the southern border of the Eastern Empire. No one saw a need for it. People knew that beyond territories more and more barren, nomadic people lived, consigned to an existence of ignorance, penury, and endemic violence. When the super tribe created by Muhammad emerged from the desert, both the Byzantines and the Persians underestimated the danger. And precisely the desert contributed to the success of the Arab armies. Thanks to the camels, on which they move rapidly in territories inaccessible to other, to other animals, and to their survival techniques, the Arabs enjoyed the same surprise factor that would characterize the Vikings two centuries later, when they appear suddenly in front of the European coasts, vanishing into the ocean after their raids. The desert granted, granted unpredictability to the Arabs' raids and safety to their retreats. It also gave them the choice of which battle they would fight in those immense territories of which, in, of which the Roman Empire was just beginning to regain control. The presence of troops was sporadic. If the Arabs' raiders detected the presence of strong military contingents, they went back into the desert unseen. Otherwise, they attacked. Their success encouraged them to new incursions. A few years later, the African deserts will be the highway they will carry them with astonishing rapidity from the Sinai to the Atlantic shores. The expedition of Khalid bin al Walid in Syria in 634 gives an example of how the Bedouins profited from their survival techniques to overcome geographical barriers considered impossible. Khalid ordered to tie the jaws of many camels after letting them drink their fill in order to block their rumination. During the crossing of the desert, these animals were gradually slaughtered and the water they carried was recovered. From its starting point in Mesopotamia, Khalid army appears near Damascus where nobody expected it. Furthermore, the Arab the Arabs were used to travel light. They were too poor to burden themselves with heavy defensive weapons such as armors, chain mails, or heavy shields. Each man carried his own provisions, normally not exceeding two kilograms of cereals. Those frugal habits were a great advantage in war. In contrast to the Germanic invasion of Europe, the Arab incursions were no migration of peoples. Every participant to that was a combatant. The Arabs were not aiming at the occupation of land for settling there with their families. They aimed at getting tributes from Medina that would be shared with it. Ummah. Another advantage of the Islamic armies was the Christianly message they carried. Always the same, over the time and the space of our conquest. 
He consisted in the offer of three alternatives to local populations. The first alternative was converting to Islam, i.e. to join the Ummah, which knew no distinction of race, nation or language. In Western languages we have uh, the concept of fatherland, the place of our ancestors, which we must protect and where we feel protected. In Arabic, um means mother, but the community that this word defines is not linked to a place. This sense of belonging to a community without geographical connotations was an advantage for a people that could soon control an area stretching from China to the Atlantic, for men joining expeditions from which they were unlikely to return also in consideration of the immense distances covered. Anyway, the choice to join the Ummah meant sharing the benefits of the conquest and to face the perspective of heaven conceived as a lush garden of perpetual abundance. The second alternative was in essence to pay for protection. The so-called people of the book, i.e. the adherents to reveal religions, Jews, Christians and Zoroastrians had the right to practice their respective religions and to enjoy the protection of the Muslims once they paid a tax for each adult male, the jizya, and later on also a tax on land. However, they were exempt from the zakat, the tribute uh, due by uh, all Muslims to the poor, and from military service. It was a decent bargain for a region that had belonged to empires at war with each other for decades, permanently in want of money and of men to send into the battle. The third alternative was obviously to fight. Here, however, the advantage of the superior motivation of the Arabs kicked in. As one of their negotiators once put it, if we die, while fighting against, against you, we will go to heaven. If instead you die, you will go to hell. In summary, either by means of a conversion or by paying a tribute, everything could continue nearly as before for local peoples. If a city spontaneously surrendered, private property was not threatened. Also because there was enough state property to requisition. The conquering armies normally prefer to reside within fortified places outside of the cities. Humar had forbidden even the purchase of private land by the Arabs. For the conquered people seized the heavy fiscal burden that characterized the two empires with their armies, their administrative apparatus, their clergies. In many regions, the Islamic conquest turned out to be advantageous from the economic point of view and from that of religious freedom. Monasteries and monuments of conquered areas were not torn down. The churches continued to be used by those to which they belonged, although it was not allowed to build new ones. There is evidence that some churches were used in alternation by Christians and Muslims until the latter built their mosques in other locations. Um, this uh, confirms that during uh, uh, the first phase of the Arab conquest, the relationship between Christians and Muslims were reasonably good. This relative religious tolerance and the possibility to obtain peace and continuity in ways of living will be crucial for the success and the consolidation of the Arab conquest. Already the Jewish community of Caesarea had rejoiced at the first Arab victory at Dati. A few months later, Khalid bin al-Walid showed up unexpectedly near Damascus and headed for the city of Busra. This very ancient city, located in the south of Syria, had once been the capital of the Roman province of the Arabia Petrea, and it retains even today its imposing Roman theatre. The city opened the gates to the invaders, as it seems, without a fight. It was the first large city of the Roman Empire to surrender to an Arab army.
From there, Khalid moved towards Gaza to join the forces of Amr, against which a Byzantine army was advancing. The Arab army joined and defeated the Romans at Dajnadain, thanks to the brilliant maneuvering of Khalid's cavalry. It was the first important military victory for the Caliphate, and it was a shock for the Byzantine army. The Romans were beaten a second time during their retreat, and took then refuge in Damascus, pursued by the Arabs who laid siege to the city. It was by then clear that the empire was confronting a major, largely unknown threat. Heraclius sent troops to the north, from the north to relieve Damascus, but the cavalry of Khalid thwarted this attempt. The siege lasted for a few months, we do not know exactly how many. As it seems, the negotiation, negotiation with groups of citizens played a key role in the fall of the city. As said, there was considerable ethnic and religious diversity in Syria at that time. Monophysites and Miaphysites were discriminated or persecuted. The Jews had been rudely treated by Heraclius on previous occasions, also with episodes of false christenings. Finally, there was a large Arab minority. They were Monophysites and therefore doubly inclined to sympathize with the invaders. The Muslim commanders were used to take advantage of such situations. Over the next few years, negotiations would often decide their sieges. Anyway, the fall of a major city like Damascus dealt the fierce blow to the Byzantines. In 635, also the city of Emesa, today's Homs, fell. In 634, in the meantime, Abu Bakr had died killed by a sudden pneumonia. The austere Umar succeeded him, succeeded him. He would lead the most spectacular conquest of the Caliphate. After the loss of Damascus, Heraclius gathered a large army in order to defeat the Arabs in a great offensive, in which the imperial troops were to take advantage of their superior equipment and number. In 636, the imperial armies moved from north into the Beka Valley and reoccupied Damascus, whence the Arabs prudently withdrew. The Byzantines then moved further south, reaching the Golan Heights, where they could find water and grazing grounds during the torrid months of August. Eventually, the two parties camped in the valley of the Yarmouk River, south of the Golan Heights, each of them had put tens of thousands of troops on the field. A huge battle was looming. On the imperial side, there was in fact a huge coalition of five armies. There were the Greek troops under the command of Theodore Victorius, um, a high-ranking official previously in charge for the imperial treasure, troops from Armenia, led by the Armenian prince Vahan, entrusted with the common in chief of the whole coalition. In addition, there were Slavic troops led by a Slav prince and Arab ones commanded by the king of the Rassanids. Finally, there were various European contingents among which a Frankish one, plus some Georgian and Persian troops, uh, among which the son of Sharbaraz, the Persian general who had laid siege to Constantinople only 10 years later. Ten years before. Ethnic, linguistic and religious barriers divided these troops. The Greek troops were Orthodox Christians, and the Arme whilst the Armenian and the Arab ones were Monophysites. Heraclius had remained in Antioch, a sign that he was confident to destroy the enemy with such enormous war effort. The Arab army rejoined the best commanders of the Caliphate but it was less numerous and less well equipped than the enemy. On its side, it had superior motivation and discipline. The battle took place in a plain east of the Sea of Galilee, uh, between the Golan Heights in the north and the Yarmouk River in the south, a tributary of the Jordan River. The Arabs camped in the east of this plain. The imperial armies had camped in the west of Having behind them 
the gorges of the various wadi flowing from, from north into the Yarmouk River, and on the right, the steep banks of the Yarmouk. The two armies confronted each other for a few weeks, during which they strengthened their respective positions and ran negotiation. As it seems, there were disagreements in the imperial coalitions, also because the orders of Heraclius to avoid the deployment of all forces in a single battle had been disobeyed. The commanders of the Arab armies had put their trust on Khalid, a genius of war tactics, already winner of dozens of battles, a master of cavalry maneuver. His had been the initiative to lure the enemy into a single battle. His the choice to station in the east of the plain in order to allow reinforcements from Medina. He had also ordered that such reinforcement reached little by little the Arab camp in order to create in the enemy the psychological urgency to attack. Eventually, the coalition attacked. The battle was savage, and it went on for six days, during which the imperial troops tried different tactics to rout the Arabs. Khalid kept on the defensive, in order to accustom the enemy to his defensive attitude. However, he managed to frustrate, with his cavalry, all attempts to break through the Arab lines. Finally, after he perceived that those failed attempts had started to produce a demoralizing effect on the enemy, one early morning, Khalid charged with all his cavalry troops. This sudden reversal of tactic took the Byzantine by surprise. The Arabs swooped down on the imperial cavalry while he was still rallying and scattering it. At this point, Entire, the entire other Arab army started to push the Roman infantry towards the ravines behind them. Once they reached the gorges, the imperial units found themselves fragmented by the landscape itself and cornered on the edge of the cliffs. On the night before the fatal day, Khalid sent a contingent to conquer the only bridge that could have consented the evacuation of the Byzantines from the area. Many imperial soldiers fell to their death down the ravines. Other having lost any hope, just sat down exhausted, waiting to be slain. The imperial army was annihilated. Most of its commanders killed. The catastrophe had a very large echo. The world was stunned, incapable to comp comprehend the causes and the implication of what had happened. According to some chronicles, a Byzantine commander had converted to Islam shortly before the battle. According to others, the Rassanid units in the coalition had switched side in the middle of the battle. According to Fredegarius, a Frankish historiographer, God had made 52,000 Byzantine soldiers die in their sleep uh, on the night before the battle. Um, the various sources, however, agree on the fact that Heraclius realized that the defeat of Yarmouk was irreparable. While the Arab armies returned to Damascus, captured Homs and moved further north, the emperor retreated to Edessa in the extreme north of the country. Eventually, he crossed with his remaining forces the Taurus Mountains, abandoning Syria to its destiny. To its destiny with the certainty that it was lost for the foreseeable future. The emperor, who had defeated the mightiest power of his time, had just seen the work of his whole life crumble. He could only try to save Anatolia and Egypt in the few years still left to him. His personal drama Found, finds an echo in the Islamic historiography, which represented Heraclius as a tragic, prescient figure, not devoid of greatness. With the departure of Heraclius, the cities of Syria opened one after the other 
their doors to the Arabs. Antioch fell in 637, followed by Apamea, Edessa, and so on. In the meantime, Arab armies had started to raid the western border of Mesopotamia, the most prosperous region of the Sassan Empire. Um, a few years before, in 632, a young grandson of Hasro, Yazdagard III, had ascended to the throne after a Travels. He had the determination, but not the experience, to confront the menace from the desert. Initially, the Arabs lost the battle because the Persian war elephants frightened their horses. Umar then gathered reinforcements in the south of the Arabian Peninsula and sent them to Mesopotamia so that a few months after the Battle of Yarmouk, the Persians suffered a crushing defeat at Qadisiya, a location between the desert and the Euphrates. From there, the Arab army rushed deeply into the Sawad, the black land of Mesopotamia, pursuing the, pursuing the Pers Persian army up to the walls of the empire's capital, Ctesiphon. The heavy floods and the occasional changes of the course of the Tigris River, which flew through the city, had never allowed the Persian to um, uh, the built fortification adequate to their capital. About ten years before, Heraclius had stopped before the city, as we have seen in Lecture 9, and chosen to stipulate with an enemy that had still much to lose a favorable peace. This time, however, it was not possible for the Persian to negotiate a peace. The many victories and a new faith were giving to the Arabs a formidable a sense of confirmation. They, they pushed them forward irresistibly and encouraged them to undertake bold initiatives, like fighting their way through the Tigris River on their horses' back. When, the, when they saw the Arabs crossing the Tigris, the Persian fled from the capital and from the Sawab, moving north towards Iran. They gathered in Jalaula a crossroad which, after which any further retreat would have put the Persians in front of the dilemma whether to split between the west and the east of their immense territory or to leave half of it without defense. There too, however, the Sassanid army was defeated in 637, and any hope of a counterattack in Mesopotamia was lost. In 642, another uh, larger battle was fought at Nahavand near the Zagros Mountains. The Persians had built a fortified position to block the Arab penetration. However, when the battle started, they made the mistake of pursuing the Arabs when they feigned a retreat and were then outmaneuvered by the Arab cavalry. The Battle of Nahavand was the final blow to the Sassanid state. From then on, the Arabs gradually conquered the whole country, while poor Yazdagard retreated further and further to the east with a decreasing number of followers, a compromising guest for more and more reluctant 
provincial governors of Persia. And eventually, one of those governors murdered him, hoping to please the incumbent Arab conquerors. This was the end of the Sassanid dynasty, who had ruled for five centuries what had been less than three decades before the world's superpower. I cannot dedicate more time to the conquest of Asia. The process had just started. From Iran, it spread to, to Afghanistan and to the Indus Valley, always with the method of putting the locals in front of the choice between conversions, tribute against protections, or war. Pragmatically, the criteria valid for the people of the book had been stretched to include even Hinduists, while immense tributes were channeled towards the caliphate. In contrast with the Germanic invaders of Europe, the Arab armies aimed at tributes, not at the land of the submitted territories. This avoided them being scattered and assimilated among the subjects. On the other hand, such focus on taxation kept alive the administrative structures of the conquered regions, which meant jobs for the locals and promoted the maintenance of written record and accounting techniques, as well as agriculture and commerce. As said, after Yarmouk, Heraclius had neither the financial means nor the soldiers to prolong the defense of Syria. Only a few coastal cities resisted, like Tripoli and Caesarea, because the Byzantine navy could supply them and frustrate thereby any possible sieges to them. The resistance of Caesarea lasted until 641, that of Tripoli until 644. For the rest, Syria fell rapidly under the control of the Caliphate. But there was in Palestine another city of immense symbolic value for the three main monotheistic religions Jerusalem, Jerusalem Sophronius, an eminent personality of the Orthodox Church had been appointed patriarch of the city. However, Jerusalem, in spite of its fortification, had no hope to withstand a siege. Sophronius requested to negotiate the capitulation personally with Caliph Omar who, in 638, traveled to Jerusalem. From him, the Patriarch obtained that the Byzantines left the city undisturbed, with their families and their belongings, for the naval base of Caesarea. As usual, the Arab leaders used a mix of force and negotiation. They declared that they were entering the holy city as pilgrims. So, in 638, Umar entered Jerusalem riding a white camel. He was, as usual, very simply dressed and was followed by an army in equally shabby clothes with enthusiastic and disciplined. Sophronius rode at his side. After visiting the area of Solomon's temple, from where, according to the Quran, Muhammad had been taken to heaven, Umar asked to visit the holy sites of the Christians, and Sophronius led him to the church of the Holy Sepulchre. While they were there, the prayer's time approached for Umar, um, and he asked whether he could lay his mat and pray.
Sophronius uh, begged him to, to, to pray on the spot. Um, but Omar preferred to exit the church and pray outside of it, in the portico, foreseeing that his followers would have one day claimed the place where he had prayed. This uh, is in fact what happened. The portico became a sacred place for Islam, and the church remained as before the holiest place for Christianity. Sophronius died a few months after the fall of Jerusalem. A new superpower had appeared on the theatre of history, fully aware by now of his role. As an Arab ambassador put it um, in the course of the negotiation with the Persians, the Arabs used to be a contemptible race on which anyone could easily trample. We had been reduced to eat dogs and lizards, but for our glory, God allowed that a prophet was born among us. In the next lecture, we will follow the Arab conquests in Africa and will begin to see their effects in, on Europe. I would like to thank my subscribers who have patiently waited that I resumed the, the English editions of my lectures while I was busy with other Italian ones. Thank you for your patience. And uh, other English lecture will now follow. Have a nice day and a presto. See you soon. Bye.